Welcome to this next episode of In a Car with IPR. We're here in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, with Mark Weiner, the Chief Insights Officer at Cision. It's a great 90 plus degrees here. It's a little warm. Uh, so today, Mark is our featured guest, and we can't wait to get started. Thanks for being here, Mark. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. All right, let's go. Okay, so Mark, you are an award winner in the industry, multi-award winner in the industry. You were the IPR Jack Felton Gold Medal Award for Lifetime Achievement and Measurement and Evaluation. Yes. And you also PR News Hall, Measurement Hall of Fame. Yes. Yes. And so you, uh, you moved here a couple of years ago from Connecticut. Yes. Um, so tell us about where we are in Florida. It's a big state. It is. We're in Ponte Vedra Beach. And I think it's appropriate that we're here because it's also the home of Jack Felton before he died. We're at the Ponte Vedra Inn and Club. It's a golf club. I'm not much of a golfer, but there's a great parallel between golf and measurement as well, where there's par for golf. We're always competing against a standard. We're competing against our friends. We're competing against past performance. And even though I'm not much of a golfer, I could see the parallel, and so it's appropriate. We're here, and I welcome you. Okay, so you are the director of the IPR Measurement Commission. Yes. You've been that for a couple of years, I believe. Two terms. Two terms. But you've been a member for a long time. So for those who may not know, why don't you tell us about the IPR Measurement Commission? It's one of our centers of excellence, and what, and what it does and sort of what its mission. The Measurement Commission was the first of the uh, centers of excellence, I think maybe 20, more than 20 years old now. And we are comprised of research practitioners, uh, research educators, public relations practitioners, working in agencies and corporations, all with a focus on communications research uh, and how it can be applied to improve performance and demonstrate the value of public relations. There's all sorts of great papers about like measuring internal comms, talking about internal communication standards, and even about some of the hot topics of why ABEs are not great, and then there's marketing mix model. There's all sorts of papers that can be accessed on the library. Promo. Um, so, <laughs> so one of those papers yes. is one that you co-authored with Sarah Kochar. Yes. Irreversible, the big data revolution. Yes. So why don't you talk a little bit about that paper and what you did in it and the focus of the case studies and all that fun stuff. The big data paper makes the case that public relations data streams are one example of a small data stream that feeds into a much larger organizational data stream. Uh, and, the, uh, and the paper includes three case studies, one from Cisco, one from Southwest, and one from... MasterCard. MasterCard, thank you. <laughs> so three case studies, and uh, irreversible because this is... Uh, a meaningful trend, and I and I don't think it's going to change and reverse anytime in the future. Okay, so you think that uh, that the, what we see in terms of just having like a great amount of access to big data, we're just going to continue just becoming more sophisticated, or um, it'll be more accessible, or we'll you know figure out more well, ways to yeah, well, it, or what do you see? All of those future? all of those elements are present. Uh, certainly the accessibility of data, I think a challenge for most communicators is the, uh, is the surplus of data and for business people generally. It's not a question of having data, it's a question of having too much data and what can be done with it. Same thing is true with automation. Everybody has a tool. Uh, we have to think about how to manage that tool to generate the, the insights that the data can reveal. Uh, and the data that's available now is enabling communicators to integrate their PR data into big data streams. Uh, there are now sources of what's called attribution data that enables people to make a connection between media that appears, earned media that appears uh, in print or online, 
and the degree to which it influences uh, people's behavior. They, they read an article, they click on that article to read it, and then after they click, they might go to a website to learn more about whatever's in the article. That can now be tracked in ways that are unobtrusive, that are, um, but are, that are very informative to the communicator to help them understand the impact of their public relations activity on the business as a whole. And we're doing a lot more in terms of behavioral science of looking at how attitudes and opinions impact uh, behavior, which I think is a pretty important stream, but just that prediction, like how you can better predict yeah. human behavior and what they're going to do, which isn't always the easy way to do it. Not the easy way, but interesting to me that, uh, you know, we focus our attention on these questions, but when we look back at uh, the foundational uh, times of public relations and its be beginnings as... Uh, Edward Bernays saw it as a social science, which suggests that research and surveys and attitudes and behavior were a key component in the way that he viewed public relations, and that was a century ago. Uh, but in common practice, yes, we're still evolving, and more and more people within public relations are being tasked to measure. They might not know enough about measurement, and they can get lots of good information on the Institute website. Yes. Thank you. Free plug. <laughs> so do you want to go inside and cool off and ask yeah. more questions? <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Let's go. <laughs> Um, okay, so IPR and um, Prime is part of CISION. We do a conference every year together, yes. the Strategic Communication and Research Conference. Yes. Some say it's the best conference in the history of the world. I know I do. I know <laughs> you do. So uh, tell us about, and, and we've been doing that conference for years. It's our fourth, well, it's the yes, fourth year yes, under yes. mine, I think, right? Yeah. My home. And, uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what that, what that is and sort of what is our overall purpose of that conference. Sure. It's an amazing conference, by the way. Yes. So um, in my day-to-day -day work, I find that people in communication are somewhere on a path towards measurement and uh, understanding measurement and evaluation. Uh, there's always a process of discovery, whether you're at the beginning of the path or at the end of the path, doing more highly evolved research like that which we talked about with the big data revolution. This conference speaks to everyone along the path, and the audience of roughly 100, 120 people uh, are, represent those places along the path. The speakers are experienced research, uh, communications research professionals. They're sharing their experiences, whether they are just getting started or whether they're fully evolved on this path. So um, I do have a question because we talked about the Prime Conference and we have people who attend to learn more about what other companies are doing, uh, but also to get a sense of like how to do research through the research bootcamp. Why has our field not figured out the measurement and evaluation piece? Why are we, 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 I mean, we've tried to talk about standards and there are some papers that talk about standards for internal comms or uh, media, but why are, as a whole, as an industry, are we not as advanced as we should be in the measurement and evaluation space? Two thoughts. One is that this question is universal. So I speak with hundreds of companies a year, all of whom express the same desire to, to um, evolve when it comes to communications research. Uh, a study was done a decade ago by the Institute in conjunction with Arthur Page in which uh, communicators, senior level communicators at organizations large and small, for-profit, not-for-profit, domestic, international, whole wide range. Uh, and they described a scenario where they know that the board and the CEO expects them to measure and they want to measure. The difficulty is that the communicators don't know enough about measurement to respond, and the board doesn't know enough about PR to guide them. So there's a stasis, there's a dance where people churn and basically stay in the same place. But there's also a breakthrough. There's, uh, you know, there's some intrepid communicators who take steps. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of my mentors earlier in my career used to say, I'd rather be approximately right than totally wrong. And this is what I say to clients. Even if you're just getting started, 
better to be approximately right than totally in the dark. And that's where many of them reside. So in, in, a, in a strange way, everybody wants the same thing, but it just requires taking this first step. I really like your answer about the CEO versus the, the comms function and how it's just a yeah. revolving door. So but what's happened since that time, as I said, is more than a decade ago that that research was done. Uh, I'm sure that CEOs and the board are becoming much more uh, aware and sensitive to what PR can do. And they, we've probably whetted an appetite for even more. And communicators now are uh, emerging from programs, university programs, where they are exposed to research. Most of the people who were CCOs 10 years ago had been former journalists or had evolved through uh, public relations in the way that it had been done. Now, leading university programs are producing the CCOs of the future, or maybe the CCOs of the present, and they've been exposed to this and they understand the benefits of research. That's great. Lots of changes in store as research measurement and evaluation become more important in the industry. Even more important. Yeah. So what's the best advice you've ever received? Uh, the best advice I, I was ever given came from an unlikely place in Ojai, California, walking down the main street, and I passed a coffee bar. Written in chalk in front of the coffee bar was this phrase, begin simply, simply begin. And that's a reminder to me constantly to, uh, to, to, uh, for myself as well as for clients and the people with whom I work to just get started. And it, it's similar to what I was saying earlier, being approximately right is better than being totally in the dark. It's just get started and I find that things have a way of um, unfolding that way if I simply begin. Uh, I also suffer from procrastination, and it's a way to overcome procrastination, or as a friend of mine calls it, uh, um, uh, forced inspiration. So I, <laughs> I, I push out a deadline to the last Deadline-driven inspiration. And then I have to do it. Uh, so, but if I take this advice to begin simply, make little steps, it, it becomes a much easier process. So this is, this is good. So what I do have some more questions to ask you. Proceed. So why don't we go in a mode of transportation yes. for the next segment? Yes. You want to do that? In a golf cart with IPR. That's right. Yes. So this next segment we're doing is taken from, you don't have to look at me, just focus on the <laughs> It's taken from James Lipton. Yes. Do you remember him? Yes. From Inside the Actor's Studio? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he asked a series of questions at the end of the celebrities on his show. Yes. So I'm going to do the same Proceed. to you. Proceed. Are you ready? Proceed. Okay. What is your favorite word? Proceed. That's your favorite word? I say it a lot. <laughs> What's your least favorite word? No. Oh, what is? So why? Because you don't like being told no? Precisely. Hmm. Any words that you just hear and you just want to knock somebody out? Literally. Literally? Especially when it's pronounced that way. Literally? Do you literally. think people misuse that? They say literally I and they mean. don't actually mean literally at all. There's a car behind us. Okay, so we obviously switch seats because we agree that I'm the better driver. Yes. Perfect. So what do you do? <laughs> ways to make, ways to pave your, your way through life. That's right. That's one of the is lessons. That the, is that one That's of the pieces of advice? That's it, just say yes. You must be um, right. You must be right. Thank you. So, <laughs> so what is one of your favorite ways to relax and unwind? I enjoy the beach. I write. And I watch television. Great. And what about your favorite band, song, music? Uh, my favorite, there's a song that I come back to by The Kinks. There's one, I love the Kinks. There's Ray one, Davies? Yeah. Yes, there's one lyric that says, This is where I belong. And I love that lyric. I can't sing it, but it's I feel a way like of. You should. It's a, I know you do. It's a way <laughs> of reminding myself to be here now. This is where I belong. Be here now. Yeah, I'm a huge Kinks fan. My favorite song, even though you're not asking, is Victoria. Your favorite song? No, my favorite Kinks song. Definitely uh, okay. not my favorite song. Okay, it's a good song. Yeah, thanks. So. <laughs> If heaven exists, what would you like God to say as you enter the pearly gates? Like the lyric I said before, this is where you belong. 
Nice, what a great way to close. This wraps up our episode of In a Car with IPR Florida Style. Thanks to our uh, guest, Mark Wiener, the Chief Insights Officer at Cision. Thanks for having us down here, Mark. It was my pleasure, thank you. It's a great compliment that you chose me to be Mark in a car with IPR. Thank you. And uh, if you like this episode, check out our others on our YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up and follow us. And thank you so much. Thank you for watching this episode of In a Car with IPR. Want to make a tax-deductible contribution to support this series and fund research in the profession? Please visit us at instituteforpr.org contribute. <laughs>